Good evening. Tonight we're going to deal with a rather unique poet, a Nobel Prize winner from Poland. We're going to talk about Wisława Zimborska, a woman born in 1923 in Bnin, in Poznan, now Western Poland. In 1931, her family moved to Krakow, and she was a teenager during World War II. After the Nazis invaded Poland, she was under the occupation. We know a woman will read about the experiences of an individual who was under Nazi occupation as a teenager, then as a young adult, and for years afterwards she was under Russian occupation. Two governments she opposed, two systems she despised, two systems she was forced to conform to. How this affects her poetry, we can only say it gives her a universal look. She's a woman who speaks without bitterness, but with deep ironies, and we'll spend some time discussing these ironies. From 1945 to 48, she attended the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, where she was a student of Polish literature and sociology. And in 1945, she published her first poem in a newspaper supplement. Seven years later, she published a collection of poetry entitled, That's What We Live For. But it was a collection of poetry she has since disparaged, refuses to publish, because it was published under the socialist, realistic mode of literature, which asked for conformity to the Russian system, which asked for a celebration of the communist cause, and which asked for criticism, which asked for no criticism and for bad criticism. Uh, Stanislaw Baranchak, who is at Harvard University and who is a translator and a commentator, perhaps the leading commentator in this country on Zimborska, has written an article called The Reluctant Poet. That appeared in the New York Times Book Review, October 27, 1996. But from 52 to 81, she worked as a critic and a staff member, wrote reviews and articles for Literary Life, Zitja Literarski, a Polish magazine. And in the, the 1980s, she was involved in the underground, publishing underground publications, undermining the communist rule, and uh, maintaining her independence as a poet. Now, she's not the first of the Nobel Prize winners in literature from Poland. In 1905, Henryk Sienkiewicz was named Poet Laureate. In 1924, Wladyslaw Raymond. We don't study these writers, but they are celebrated in their own country, of course, and perhaps in Europe. We do know one Polish writer whom we discussed this year, Isaac Bashevis Singer, who left Poland and who earned United States citizenship and won the Nobel Prize as a United States citizen. Still active, Czesław Minos won the Nobel Prize in 1980, and Wazla and Zimborska won it in 1996. Her prize was the largest of all the prizes at the time, $1.12 million, uh, a significant award and apparently well-deserved. No one complains about Zimborska. Uh, 
getting the Nobel Prize. What are her works? Let's look at a few of them because we're going to discuss some of them tonight. Nin in 1952, the book That's What We Live For, collection of poetry, was the one that she has uh, chosen to ignore. And 1954, Questions Put to Myself. But her first substantial work that seems to be the work she wishes to advertise, the work she wishes to see republished, uh, published, uh, was entitled Culling Out to Yeti. And Yeti is really a, uh, a word. This is an abominable snowman. But she compla complains and makes the analogy that the Russian leaders are abominable snowmen. And the book deals with the criticism of the communist government, among other questions. In 1962, salt. And we'll have uh, Mr. Harrison discuss salt this evening. Uh, he'll discuss five poems from this book. In a, uh, 1965, her poetry first gained acknowledgment when it was published by Czeslaw Milos in his book, Post-War Polish Poetry. By the way, in my previous slide, I mentioned Milos. That was a misspelling. It's Milos. In 1967, No End of Fun, 1972, Could Have. And Miss Scannell is going to be discussing poems from Could Have tonight. Uh, after my introduction, you'll hear these two speakers, and then we'll move on from there. In 1976, A Large Number. 1981, Sounds, Feelings, Thoughts, comprising 70 poems in her canon. In 1983, Poge, or Poems. In 1986, a very provocative book dealing with people, the way people think, the way people move, the way they operate in the people on the bridge. And in 1993, a rather impressive book, The End and the Beginning. We'll look at some of those works tonight. The book that we're looking at, the book that we have purchased for this course, is View with a Grain of Sand. And it actually contains most of the poems from these previous editions, so that it's actually an anthology of many of her works from these books that have been published in the past. The poems were translated by Stanislaw Boranchak and Claire Kavanagh. This book won the Book of the Month Club translation prize for these translators, and 4,000 copies were sold. And that's a formidable sale in our days. A few facts about Zimborska. She's been married, she was married twice. Her first husband, Adam Rodek, she divorced. The second husband, Cornel Filipovich, was a writer. We're told that she shared the love of fishing with him. And his death left her somewhat depressed. In fact, the book, The End and the Beginning, was inspired by his death. I don't mean she was left depressed in a, uh, a therapeutic way or a medical way. She was close to him, and the loss stimulated the end and the beginning. One of the poems in this book, Cat in the Empty Apartment, according to Beta Schmiel, editor of Ex Libris, a Polish literary magazine, says, it's the best poem I have read about death. This was in a review that appeared in the Los Angeles Times in 1996. Cat in the Empty Apartment. Let me just mention briefly some of these lines that may make this poem one of the greatest poems about death ever written, according to this speaker. If you turn in your book to page 189, and when I call these up on the computer, 
you'll see the page number so you can turn yourself to the poem. The poem begins. Now remember, this is an indebtedness to her husband who has passed away. Of course, cats don't pass away so easily. They have nine lives. And so she begins the poem with, Rye wit, die. You can't do that to a cat. Since what can a cat do in an empty apartment? Climb the walls? Rub up against furniture? Nothing seems different here, but nothing is the same. Nothing has been moved, but there's more space. And at nighttime, no lamps are lit, so that her imagery of death is the absence of her husband, is the reality that events are changed by virtue of his not being there, not because something has happened to remind her of these events. Some of the lines from this poem, footsteps on the staircase, but they're new ones. She knows they're not her husband's. The hands that put fish on the saucer has changed, too. Now, what I'd like to do is discuss her poetry, but discuss Zimborska as a writer. There are a lot of people who have discuss the art of writing, what I want to do is go to one of the most famous of all in English literature, Samuel Johnson. Johnson gives us what I think is a good matrix for understanding Zimborska's works. In Rasselas, which he wrote in 1759, in chapter 10, he tells us the role of a poet. You can see it on the screen in a minute. Johnson writes, to a poet, nothing can be useless. Whatever is beautiful and whatever is dreadful must be familiar to his vast imagination. The poet must be conversant with all that is awfully vast or elegantly little. The plants of the garden, the animals of the wood, the minerals of the earth, and meteors of the sky must all concur to store his mind with inexhaustible variety. And what we're going to do tonight is have you discover the inexhaustible variety in the works of Zimborska. Johnson goes on to say, but the knowledge of nature is only half the task of the poet. He must be acquainted likewise with all the modes of life. His character requires that he estimate the happiness and misery of every condition. Observe the power of all the passions and all their combinations, and trace the changes of the human mind as they are modified by various institutions and accidental influences of climate or custom, from the sprightliness of infancy to the despondence of decrepitude. Jaborska fits these characteristics, too. She takes us from infancy, and she takes us to old age. And you'll see how she does it in these poems. What else must a poet do? The poet, according to Johnson, and again, Jaborska follows these criteria. The poet must divest himself of the prejudices of his age or country. He must consider right and wrong in their abstracted and invariable state. 
he must disregard present laws and opinions and rise to general and transcendental truths which will always be the same. He must therefore content himself with the slow progress of his name. And indeed, it took many years for Zimborska's name to come into the popular culture and for Western civilization to know this formidable woman. The poet must condemn the applause of his own time and commit his claims to the justice of posterity. He must write as the interpreter of nature and the legislator of mankind and consider himself as presiding over the thoughts and manners of future generations. More on what the poet must do. His labor is not yet at an end. He must know many languages and many sciences, and that his style may be worthy of thoughts must by incessant practice familiarize to himself every delicacy of speech, every grace of harmony. Now, if the poet has to know details, surely Zimborska knows details. Here she is in a poem called Close, which appears in, on page 137 of your book, A View with a Grain of Sand. She describes clothes. You take off. We take off, they take off coats, jackets, blouses, double-breasted suits made of wool, cotton, cotton polyester, skirts, shirts, underwear, slacks, slips, socks, pudding, hanging, tossing them across the backs of chairs, the wings of metal screens. Well, to this extent, Jimborska differs with Johnson. Johnson says, you must not measure the streaks of the tulip. You're not supposed to get particular. You're not supposed to be microscopic. You're supposed to look at general truths. But here is Zaborska being microscopic. Imagine a poet talking about cotton polyester and slips and socks and tossing them across the backs of chairs. She tells us. It's time to tie, to fasten with shaking hands, shoelaces. To fasten with shaking hands. Now, here we get old age. To fasten with shaking hands, shoelaces, buckles, Velcro, zippers, snaps, belts, buttons, cufflinks, collars, neckties, clasps. And to pull, our, pull out of our handbags, pockets, sleeves, a crumpled, dotted, flowered, checkered scarf whose usefulness has suddenly been prolonged. Look at that, a crumpled, dotted, flowered, checkered scarf. Is that poetry? Or is that a shopping list from Kmart? She says it's poetry. Well, writing for her means encompassing and encapsulating and discovering everything. I'm going to go back to the 18th century, to Alexander Pope, who talks about writing. He wrote from the time he was a youngster, and he felt that this was the only thing he could do. And people knew that he was an inveterate poet and a poet ob obsessive with his fame and obsessive with his art and obsessive with his subjects. But he doesn't know why he became a writer. Pope says, why did I write? What sin to me unknown dipped me in ink? My parents or my own? Zimborska uses ink, too, in an interesting poem we'll show, talk about later. He says, what sin to me unknown dipped me in ink? My parents or my own? Who condemned me to this obsessive practice? As yet a child, nor yet a fool to fame, I lisped in numbers, for the numbers came. Oh, let me live my own, and die so too. Let me maintain a poet's dignity and ease, and see what friend 
and read what books I please. A poet can see anyone he pleases and can read anything he pleases and no one can tell him anything else. Oh, let me live my own and die so too. Maintain a poet's dignity and ease and see what friend and, what, and read what books I please. Well, here is what Jim Borska says about writing. This is a poem on page 35 called The Joy of Writing. She says, lying in wait, set to pounce on a blank page, are letters up to no good. She's not sure what she's going to write. But when she writes, some people are going to regret what she said because her lines are ironic and her message sometimes undesired. She says, lying wait are these letters, clutches of clauses so subordinate they'll never let her get away. She says, each drop of ink contains a fair supply of hunters. The ink is hunting for the words. Pope says, the ink, I'm forced to write in ink. She says, the ink has words in it, and they're going to come out. I'm not sure what they are. Each drop of ink contains a fair supply of hunters prepared to swarm the sloping pen. Sometimes she writes very weighty words. Sometimes she writes profound statements. Sometimes she uses words so grandiloquent and so splendiferous in her panoply of words that she wonders where they even come from. Her poem, Under One Small Star, in pages 91 to 92, tells us, don't bear me ill will speech that I borrow weighty words, then labor heavily so that they may seem light. She discusses words in that poem on pages 91 to 92. She says, this is necessity. I'm obliged to write words. She says, my apologies to chance for calling it necessity. I don't know why I write. And I don't know why the subject I write about becomes so momentous. What does she write about, she says. My apologies to time for all the world I overlook each second. My apologies to past loves for thinking that the latest is the first. She says, my apology, forgive me, distant wars, for bringing flowers home. Forgive me, open wounds, for pricking my finger. Pardon me, hounded hope, for laughing from time to time. Pardon me, deserts, that I don't rush to you, or deserts, pardon me, deserts, that I don't rush to you bearing a spoonful of water. And you, falcon, unchanging year after year, always in the same cage, your gaze always fixed on the same point in space, forgive me, even if it turns out you were stuffed. She says she writes about all these subjects, and she can't keep herself. And she can't keep herself from explaining what her words of poetry ultimately expli explicate in terms of our understanding of human life, of human creation, of existence, or of human sadness. But when she writes, she accepts many ideas that she puts on, papers, on paper, and some she rejects. Now, the toughest thing for a writer to do 
is to tear up something you've written. The toughest thing to do is to take a sentence you think you like and discover it doesn't fit and remove it. And in the poem, a large number, which you find on page 95, she says, my choices are rejections, since there is no other way. When she makes a choice, she must reject other choices. When she makes a decision to use a word, she must reject other words. When she chooses to use a phrase, she has done this against other phrases in her mind. She says, my choices are rejections, since there is no other way. But what I reject is more numerous, denser, more demanding than before. A little poem, a sigh, at the cost of indescribable losses. It used to be, when writers didn't have computers, that they would type words on a manuscript, and then they would cross out these words and have to retype them, and they would save their manuscripts. So that today, in many libraries around the world, we have the words of Dickens, and we have the words of Trollope, and we have the words of Dostoevsky, and we have the words of others who have crossed out statements they've made. And we know their choices. We know what words they had originally. We know what words they want. They decided to insert. We know what Emily Dickinson, many, many poems she's written, where she's crossed out numerous words and put in new words. And so we know exactly what these choices are. We know words that she accepted. We know what she rejected. But with computers, when a poet sits down and he substitutes five or six words and simply erases off the screen what was in his mind, we lose this ability to see the words the writers reject. And it's going to be a great loss in understanding the operation of the mind and in trying to discover how an editor or how a writer finally decides what he must use and what he must reject. So she says, a little poem, a sigh, at the cost of indescribable losses. I whisper my reply to my stentorian colleague. Who is Stentor? Stentor was a classical rhetorician. He announced events. And so her poetry is stentorian, even as quiet as it seems, even as ironic as it seems, even as wry as it seems. She has this stentorian voice that makes her poetry readable and makes her poetry the poetry of a Nobel laureate. But then she concludes this statement by saying, I can't tell you how much I pass over in silence. Those of you who are poets, how much good material have you chosen not to use for the better material you have accepted? And then she gets a little ironic. Remember Pope said, why do I write? What sin, either my parents or my own, has, has, has given me this obsessive character to write words and to say what I think? Here in a poem, she talks about people who don't write. And she thinks they may be better off. Zaborska says, my sister doesn't write poems. This is in praise of my sister, pages 112 to 113 in this book. She says, my sister doesn't write poems, and it's unlikely that she'll suddenly start writing poems. She takes after her mother, who didn't write poems, and also her father, who likewise didn't write poems. I feel safe beneath my sister's roof. <laughs> my sister's husband would rather die than write poems. But then she goes on to tell what her sister does do. My sister has tackled oral prose with some success. By the way, we all speak oral prose. Uh, 
there's a famous play, French play, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, where the hero discovers that he speaks prose. He's so proud of this accomplishment. We all speak prose, but we don't know what we call it. My sister has tackled oral prose with some success, says Jim Borska, but her entire written opus consists of postcards from vacations whose text is only the same promise every year. When she gets back, she'll have so much, much, much to tell. Of course, we all go on vacations, and we come back, and we want to say so much to people. And then we end up not having any occasion. Or we turn to someone and say, I just got back from Barcelona, and what a wonderful time I had. And before you have a chance to discuss what you've said, the person, turns you said, the person turns to you and says, yes, I was there 10 years ago, and let me tell you what we did. And you never have a chance to tell about your trip. Poets have the opportunity to talk about their trips, because theirs is the art of writing. Theirs is the art of imposing on print, in squeezing out of this ink the words that others will ultimately read. And while her sister has so much, much, much to tell that she'll never tell, Zimborska has so much, much to tell that she will tell, and so much that we'll never see on the page because she has rejected it and found it not suitable for her standard of writing. Now I'd like to talk about another phase of Zimborska's work. And that is her ability to discuss what she has studied. Poets don't talk off the top of their heads. Poets don't deal off the top of their heads. Poets write from their lessons, from their studies, and from their experience. Now here's an interesting poem that she's written called Reality Demands on pages 184 to 185 from this collection called The End and the Beginning. She says, Reality demands that we also mention this. Life goes on. It continues at Canae and Borodino at Kosovo Polje in Guernica. She says, where Hiroshima had been, Hiroshima is again producing many products for everyday use. Now this poem is really a study of history. It's a study of what happens to the past. It tells us that we go beyond the past to live through tragedies, to live through war, to live through battle, and we emerge as a civilized people always trying to find our place in this creation, in this civilization. Now in order to read this poem, you've got to know the history she's describing. Where is, what is Kanai? What is Borodino? What is Kosovo Poche? What is Guernica? What is Hiroshima? If you turn to this poem on page 184 to 185, you'll see all the historical sites she describes. I'm going to mention a few of them because you don't write poetry without knowledge. You don't write con about contemporary issues without a knowledge of the past. Thomas Gray, the famous 18th century poet, was a professor of history, not of literature. And Zaborska is a poet of history. Let's look at this. She describes Jericho, which occurred, <coughs> celebrated about the 13th century, the Canaanite city won by Joshua and the Israelites of the Exodus. It's also a possible reference as well to the Jews reclaiming rights to live in the city after the establishment of the State of Israel in 48 and the 1967 war. 
we have to go almost 1,300 years for the next allusion to Cannae. Hannibal's conquest and slaughter of the Roman encampment at Cannae, the surprise attack. The famous story of Hannibal's crossing the Alps with his elephants is part of this experience. She describes Charonia, and this was a battle in the year 110 BC involving the defense of a Greek colony, a war involving Mithridates IV. It may also be a reference to the city of Cherzanes, destroyed by Justinian II, who had been imprisoned there as an exile. But she does mention Actium, a promontory in northern Greece, where we see Octavian's decisive victory over Mark Antony, where 200 ships on each side fought in this battle, Octavius against Antony, with Cleopatra intervening. Now what kind of poem is it that deals with Jericho, that deals with Greece, that deals with Antony, that deals with Cleopatra, that spans 2,000 years already, and then another 1,000 years bringing us from Actium up to Hastings with the defeat of William, with William the Conqueror's Norman defeat of the Saxons. And then another 1,700 years where we come to Maciejowicz's field, the Polish dictator Kosciuszko, who gave the peasants their freedom, fought in these fields, Maciejowicz's fields, against the Russians. At first he was successful. He gained three quarters of the territory back from the Russians. But then he suffered a final defeat. And Russia was I mean, Warsaw was conquered by the Russians amidst a terrible massacre. So Zaborska is telling us in this poem that there are battles and there are defeats and there are people massacred and there are victors and there are losers and somehow we survive. He talks about the Battle of Borodino, September 7th, 1812. The battle between Napoleon and Kutuzov, giving Napoleon control over Moscow. 42,000 French were killed in the battle, one third of all of Napoleon's troops. 32,000 Russians were killed in this battle one quarter of all of the Russian troops. Then we move on to Kosovo Polce, October 12 to 24, 1912. It's a Serbian defeat of the Turks, leading to the demise of the Ottoman Empire. And the, then the Battle of Verdun, a World War I battle with a loss of one million lives. One million lives lost at Verdun in World War I. And these are the wars we have to get past. And these are the million families who have to survive these, this terrible onslaught. Guernica in 1937 39, the site of heavy fighting between the Basque separationists and Spain's Franco. Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, with a Japanese sneak attack on the American fleet in Hawaii. And she mentions Hiroshima, the first city to be hit with an atomic bomb, in August 6, 1945. A million people killed in Verdun. The predictions were that that's the number of American or Allied troops that would be killed in Japan had we invaded Japan instead of dropping the bomb. Now, this is what Jimborska has written. And I want to look briefly at that poem one more time, just to see that now you have the historical details. Now you go back to page 184 and 185, and with this knowledge of history, you, un you understand the breadth and sweep of Zimborska's poetry.
And by the way, this does fit the thesis of Samuel Johnson. She doesn't give us the issues of war. She doesn't tell us how people were bayoneted to death. She doesn't describe the horses squirming and squealing on the battlefield under the bodies of fallen soldiers. She doesn't give us the gruesome details of people dead on the field with their intestines blown out of them. She, all she does is give you the names of the battles. And those who have read Josephus, and those who have read the great historians will understand what illusion she is bringing to mind. This poem, Reality Demands. Reality demands that we also mention this, life goes on. It continues at Canai and Borodino, at Kosovo, Polche, and Guernica. There's a gas station on a little square in Jericho and wet paint on park benches in Vila Hora. Letters fly back and forth between Pearl Harbor and Hastings. Letters between Pearl Harbor and Hastings? Sneak battles? How did William conquer Hastings? How did the, Pearl, how did the Japanese conquer Pearl Harbor? A moving van passes beneath the eye of the lion at Cherania and the blooming orchards near Verdun cannot escape the approaching atmospheric front. Now let's go on page 185 to the last verse on that page and see how she carries this. Perhaps all fields are battlefields. All grounds are battlegrounds. Those we remember and those that are forgotten. The birch, cedar, and fir forests the white snow, the yellow sands, gray gravel, the iridescent swamps, the canyons of black defeat, where, in times of crisis, you can cower under a bush. And she says, what moral flows from this? Probably none. And there you get the cynicism and the irony. What have we learned from these wars? For those of us living today and seeing what's happening in Serbia, seeing what's happening in Nigeria, we know that we don't learn very much from the past. Only the blood flows drying quickly. And as always, a few rivers, a few clouds. We have a lot to say about Zimborska. And we're going to have more to say about her writing ability, her selection of poetic tropes, her attitude toward government. But at this time, we're going to ask Mr. Harrison to come up and discuss poems from Salt. And then later on, Ms. Scannell will be dealing with poems from the selections in our text could have. I think we're dealing with a formidable poet here and one whom you shall not easily forget. Mr. Harrison. Ms. Simborska, in her 1996 Nobel Prize lecture, in a sense defines what a poet is and what, what, she, what they do. Uh, it's rather interesting that she opens her speech with the phrase, they say that the first sentence in any speech is always the hardest, and that that one's behind her. In a sense, this is like a search topos uh, in which the author begins a poem or a passage and sets things in motion up to a turning point. And at that turning point, there is then a different direction taken. Um, 
Wasala in her, or Ms. Samborska in her Nobel lecture, goes on to sort of develop an identity of the poet and exactly what is a poet in comparison to the world. Her Nobel lecture is actually titled The Poet and the World. In a sense, she wants to juxtapose or make similar the qualities of them. Um, when she, in her speech, she, she mentions that contemporary poets are skeptical and suspicious, um, especially about themselves. Um, in this sense, the poet is like a, a young child or a baby, which is seeking development and seeking form, just as a poem, when it starts off, is also seeking development and form at the beginning of it. Um, and this is sort of a question as to what, what will the poet become, and then also what will the poem become. Um, one crucial identifying element of the poet seems to be an official stamp of approval from uh, people like the Nobel Prize Literature Award. Uh, this stamp of approval is, in a sense, what the poet is to society. Uh, but it leaves some question as to what the, what the poet is themselves, as an individual. Um, the process of poetry, Ms. Zimborska says, is sitting on a couch, naked, waiting for the self to arrive. In a sense, this again um, mimics the birthing process, not only of a poet as an individual, but also as uh, the poem as a starting point. It's a blank page, and words slowly fill it and, and create definition and create a thing which will go through a transformation. One, one element of uh, Ms. Zimborska's poetry is that she does take on a number of topics. One important topic is a philosophical discussion. Uh, she engages language. Um, and also knowledge with the sense that it's not stagnant and it's not like a scientific knowledge which is very well defined and is knowable. In her speech, she does mention that knowledge that doesn't lead to new questions quickly dies out. It fails to maintain the temperature required for sustaining life. In a sense, this is the purpose of the poet, to continue asking questions, to get the search on the way, to bring the, bring the child up and to get to that turning point or to the climax in which a new direction can, can be taken and uh, people can continue to write poetry and indeed continue to uh, live and make interesting queries. Um, at the end of her Nobel Prize lecture, um, she approaches a topic of astonishment or wonder, which also may be called the mystery of life or the quest searching for something that is unknowable, like the blank page. One phrase that Ms. Samborska likes to hinge on or repeats over and over in her speech is the phrase, I don't know. The idea that knowledge is a fresh thing and we must always ask questions in order to continue. She also says that her astonish that astonishment or this idea of not knowing what a thing is or what a poem is or what a nation is or what an individual is from the, from the beginning exists per se, but it doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily based on comparison with something else. The act of the poet is to choose one way or the other and work through it to see exactly where the journey will take us. I'm going to move on to the first poem I'm covering tonight. I'm covering five poems. Um, the first one is Lesson, which is not on top. Hold on a second. Uh, in Lesson, Ms. Samborska sort of outlines the philosophical inquiry which I was discussing earlier. Um, she does it in a way by using language. All right, uh, and it's, it's interesting that uh, this poem occurs in the beginning 
of the salt selection in this collection of poetry. Uh, in a sense, it provides us an instructional tool with which to move through our understanding of Ms. Samborska, who we are, as of yet, fairly unfamiliar with, apart from Dr. Rothman's uh, introductory statements and, and dissertations. Um, but this is, this is the lesson she provides for us, which can be viewed as a type of map uh, for the forming process on a, on a quest. Um, let me just read it. Lesson. Subject King Alexander, predicate cuts direct object, the Gordian knot, with his indirect object sword. This had never predicate entered anyone's object mind before. None of a hundred philosophers could disentangle this knot. No wonder each now shrinks in some secluded spot. The soldiers, loud and with great glee, grab each one by his trembling gray goatee and predicate drag object him out. Enough's enough. The king calls for his horse, adjusts his crested helm, and sallies forth. And in the, his wake, with trumpets, drums, and flutes, his subject army, made of little knots, predicate marches off to indirect object war. It's interesting that she would choose the topic of a King Alexander and the Gordian Knot, uh, which was a puzzler for, for many of years. Um, in the word subject, for instance, is an interesting word uh, because it, it, of course, refers to the grammatical uh, beginning of a sentence. Um, it, it also acts in opposition to the actual subject in the poem, which is King Alexander. You can see it in the first line here, uh, the italicized subject and King Alexander. The, uh, the separation is very interesting, and Ms. Samborska begins to make the separation throughout her poetry, which seems to indicate a division of identity of individual versus society, and how those two play off of one another. She continues to go on, um, untying the knot with an actual sword, in opposition to the philosophers who tried to untie the knot through thinking and conception. The sword is an interesting image because it's, in a sense, like the sword of the poet, which is a pen. And Ms. Samborska is penning us a lesson. She is also teaching us how, through language, we can separate the individual from the society and form different identity structures. Um, I'd actually like to read a critical analysis. Um, I left my critical papers there. Could you? Uh, let, me, let me go on to talk a little bit more about, it's just those in your left hand, yeah, right hand. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, Edward Hirsch, in a critical essay, m mentions um, comments on Samborska's conceptual, conceptualized poetry. Let me just read his quote real quick. Uh, Samborska is a highly conceptual poet and an idiosyncratic one. Reading the great 20th century poets, Eliot, for example, in Vallejo, one feels the language moving mysteriously ahead of thought. The combination of words unlocking perceptions deeper than the conscious mind. Hence, the high premium these poets place on the irrational and the unconscious in the creative process. In Samborska's case, the governing rationale of a poem comes first and then develops in unexpected directions while the poem shifts to close range. I'm going to move on to The Monkey, which is actually the first poem in the, in the in the selection. Uh, let me get both pages up here. And you can sort of see this process take place in which um, we are given a picture of a monkey and it goes through some really, I, I think, surprising uh, changes. Uh, let me read the poem here. The monkey, evicted from the garden long before the humans, he had such infectious eyes that just one glance around old paradise made even angels' hearts feel sad and sore, emotions hitherto unknown to them. 
Without a chance to say, I disagree, he had to launch his earthly pedigree. Today, still nimble, he retains his charm with a primeval E after the M. Worshipped in Egypt, Pleiades of fleas, spangling his sacred and silvery mane, he'd sit and listen in arc silent peace. What do you want, a life that never ends? He turned his ruddy rump as if to say, such life he neither bans nor recommends. In Europe, they deprived him of his soul, but they forgot to take his hands away. There was a painter monk who dared portray a saint with palms so thin they could be simian. The holy woman prayed for heaven's favor as if she waited for a nut to fall. Warm as a newborn, with the old man's tremor imported to king's courts across the seas, he whined while swinging on his golden chain, dressed in the garish coat of a marquis. Prophet of doom, the court is laughing, please. Considered edible in China, he makes boiled <clears throat> or roasted faces when laid upon a salver. Ironic as a gem set in sham gold, his brain is famous for its subtle flavor, though it's no good for trickier endeavors. For instance, thinking up gunpowder. In fables lonely, not sure what to do, he fills up mirrors with his indiscreet self-mockery, a lesson for us, too. The poor relation who knows all about us, though we don't greet each other when we meet. Uh, returning to my topic regarding the development of the individual, uh, Ms. Samborska here provides us, a, in a sense, a history of the monkey. And it's, I think it's sort of a surprising history, uh, which we can see in the first line when she describes him as being evicted from the garden before the humans. Um, it's interesting, I looked up uh, the story of the creation, and it's actually the snake who gets evicted from the garden first. So this is a rather surprising start. It's, it's, it's uh, different anyway. Um, in, in Darwinian senses, we can sort of compare, uh, which contrasts the topological uh, references in the Bible, uh, but the Darwinian idea of humans coming from the monkey is rather, rather intriguing in the sense of this uh, story because it gives the human reader who is reading a description of the monkey uh, something to compare themselves against. And if we, if we sort of also include um, the ideas about subject, predicate, and direct object from the lesson we can see what she does with this, with this description of the monkey and how it compares to the human. The subject in this poem is the monkey, uh, and the humans act upon the monkey or do things to the monkey. If we, if we go down the poem, it's sort of split in half. It's anatomical in a sense. Uh, the monkey is separated from the humans, <coughs> excuse me, and then the uh, humans uh, later, later on, um, worship the monkey, uh, which is which is also interesting in the sense of sort of setting the the monkey up to be something more possibly than he is. Um, the the monkey, however, does not have the opportunity to choose. She does. They, they do not have the sense of consciousness or morality. In the phrase, I disagree, on line seven, uh, this is pointed out. Um, it's, it's interesting how the humans are continually acting upon the monkey. Uh, later on in the fifth stanza, they're actually eating its brains with a silver spoon. One, uh, but the brain, of course, is not capable of deciding or of making choices, for instance, thinking of gunpowder. As we get to the end of the poem, we notice a sort of surprising turn there as well, which is in the last line, though we don't greet each other when we meet. Um, just before that, she says, who knows all about us? Uh, it's interesting that she says that because she sort of endows the monkey at the end with a sense of knowledge about the human individual. Um, and it's, it's an interesting way to look at yourself, too, in some senses. Uh, in comparison to society, because this monkey is definitely a very individualized character, but society, in a sense, takes parts of him away. It, it worships him, but at the same time, it eats its brains. Uh, it's a terrifying notion 
of developing a social identity uh, for the individual. I'm going to move on because I think I'm running out of time. And let, let me talk about, for a minute, uh, the poem Shadow. This is the third poem here. And again, here we can see ideas about the development of the individual and uh, the search tafos. The poem is <coughs> called Shadow. My shadow is a fool whose feelings are often hurt by his routine of rising up behind his queen to bump his silly head on ceilings. His is a world of two dimensions, that's true, but flat jokes still can smart. He longs to flaunt my court's conventions and drop a roll he knows by heart. The queen leans out above the sill. The jester tumbles out for real. Thus they divide their actions still. It's not a 50-50 deal. My jester took on nothing less than royal gestures, shameless. The things that I am too weak to bear, the cloak, crown, scepter, and the rest. I'll stay serene, won't feel a thing. Yes, I will turn my head away after I say goodbye, my king. At railway station N someday, my king, it is the fool who will lie across the tracks. The fool, not I. If we think about the, the difference between the shadow and the speaker, and the king and the queen and the jester, uh, again, this sort of uh, reminds me of the lesson in the Gordian Knot in which she's developing a medieval kind of structure here in comparison to her own self and shadow. Um, in the same sense that the subject of the poem, which is the my, the speaker of the poem, has a, a shadow, uh, it relates to the individual versus society, in which the individual seems kind of like a shadow of society. Um, and of course, this gives rise to all kinds of interesting uh, uh, antics. She, go, she does say that this is a world of two dimensions, um, which again would, would sort of mimic or exemplify the difference between the individual and society, which seems to be two dimensional. She, does, she further goes on to uh, talk about the division of the jester and how he sort of makes this a humorous game or a comedy um, as opposed to something terrifying, which you might see in poems like the Starvation Camp near Jalasco, Jal Jaslo, rather, uh, in which she sort of resurrects the individual from the rubble of a starvation camp. At the, at the end of the poem, uh, she says that it is uh, her, the individual who will lie across the tracks, the, the shadow who will lie across the tracks, and not her. Uh, she is a realist in some senses and believes in the community as a defining form and, in a sense, helps, helps keep the shadow in line or helps to keep uh, the shadow across tracks, depending on how you look at it. Um, I'm going to close with reading the poem Synopsis, which is a, another biblical story, um, sort of hinting back vaguely at the monkey, which is sort of a garden or creation story. Um, and this, this poem seems to sum up how she feels that the individual should contribute to society um, and maybe what the effort should be. As I've already mentioned, her, she does seem to say that the poet's job is to ask questions, and that is also the individual's ultimate choice or, dis, or involvement in society is to continue seeking knowledge through the asking of questions. Let's look at the instance of synopsis, though, and see what we can discover. Synopsis. Job sorely tried in both flesh and possessions, curses man's fate. It is great poetry. His friends arrive and, rending their garments, dissect Job's guilt before the Lord. Job cries out that he was righteous. Job does not know why the Lord smote him. Job does not want to talk to them. Job wants to talk to the Lord. The Lord 
God appears in a chariot of whirlwinds. Before him who had been cloven to the bone, he praises the work of his hands, the heavens, the seas, the earth, and the beasts thereon, especially behemoth and Leviathan in particular, creatures of which the deity is justly proud. It is great poetry. Job listens, the Lord God beats around the bush, for the Lord God wishes to beat around the bush. Job therefore hastily prostrates himself before the Lord, even now transpire in rapid su succession. Job regains his donkey and camels, his oxen and sheep twofold. Skin grows over his grinning skull, and Job goes along with it. Job agrees. Job does not want to ruin a masterpiece. This is a perplexing situation, I think, in, in Samborska, who makes the statement in her lecture that poet's job is to continue asking questions in the pursuit of knowledge, and in a sense, giving momentum to, to the discovery of knowledge, also the discovery of the individual. Um, Job, in this poem, um, is, is, is again taken advantage of, like the monkey, by society. Uh, they inflict him with diseases. They take his possessions away. Um, but all in all, he has faith in, in his God. He has faith in the structure of individual versus society. And he goes along with it because he realizes the beauty of it or the, the way that it works together uh, in a sense like the lesson between subject, indirect object, and the predicate in the middle, which is the transforming or the separating element between individual and society. Um, I want to go on to read a few of the a few more of the critical two more critical quotes uh, and see what we can think about these in relation to the poems I've read. Uh, Stanislaw Barat Baransak uh, mentions, one fundamental reason for the accessibility of Symborsk's poetry is that the pressing questions she keeps asking are, at least at first sight, naive, as those of the man on the street. At the same time, the brilliance of her poetry lies in pushing the inquiry much further than the man in the street ever could or would. Symborsk has given us a picture of a monkey, a shadow, a Gordian knot, which is sort of a, a confusing element, probably for some people. Uh, but she's also given us uh, the story of Job. All of these things are, are bits and pieces of all of our lives which we can relate to. And she does this to reach out um, through her descriptive poetry, which has a form which isn't very strict. It, it usually vacillates between um, varied stanza lengths, uh, giving it a sort of nice, easy rhythm and understandable rhythm. Um, but she also does include philosophical arguments and ideas of how language works to develop arguments. Let me read my last critical analysis by Alice Catherine Carls. In the opposition between reality and art, life and intellect, Samborska declares herself on the side of reality and life. Ideas are most often pretext to kill a deadly weapon, whether under the guise of an artistic experiment, political utopia, or ideological fanaticism. Samborska sides with reality against art and ideology, and this choice situates her in the mainstream of post-war Polish poetry. This is kind of an interesting idea uh, in the sense, as I've said before, um, Ms. Samborska wants to relate to the man on the street. She wants to talk about the situation that human beings are in. She wants to give the individual something to grab onto uh, to identify themselves against the mass of society, which a lot of us can get lost in. Um, this, this process of cutting the poem up or dissecting it into three parts and comparing it both to individual and society is a rhetorical term known as anatomy. 
Um, she also seems to use a form both in the, the whole book, uh, which is composed upon three sections, the stand, the turning point, and the end of the book. The stand is like, again, as I mentioned earlier, the beginning part of the poem, the blank page in which she sets up her subjects. The turning point in the middle of the poem is referred to as a trope. Um, and that's where things change, or the idea that she started off with changes. And it's usually through the predicate, as in the Gordian Knot, or the uh, lesson poem that I read. Uh, the third part is the antistrope, or the, the, the change of direction in a different direction from the starting point. Um, in this sense, individuals develop through this process. They start off as an individual, or not really knowing who they are, and they strive to mimic or to copy and learn from the society around them, which is called an identity crisis. And they, they move towards this point, and once they realize what they can latch on to, they then turn and move on in another direction, seeking even a greater definition of their own identity, both within themselves and within society. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. You mentioned anatomy. You mentioned a few trope. I'll take a few moments just to look at a few other trope that Zimborska uses to give us some sense of what she is doing. Now, if you have in your library all the books that you were asked to purchase for this course, you would have Richard Lanham's hand list of rhetorical terms. And uh, the word anatomy appears in that work. We're going to look at Lanham and then look at the term alliteration. In a poem on page 39, Zimborska uses alliteration. The Fs are repeated. Those frills or furbelows, however flounced and whirly, barred no one from family photographs. Now, when we come back after the break in a few moments, we're going to talk about photography, and we're going to talk about what happens when people take their first photographs and the joy of the family when they see their youngster in front of the camera. Let's look at another trope that's used. Sometimes there are illusions. And Zimborska says in one poem, no one in this family has ever died of love. No food for myth and nothing magisterial. She says in her family, people have not had very interesting love affairs. And she says, there are no consumptive Romeos, no Juliet's diphtherial. The people in our family have died of consumption. The people in our family have died of diphtheria, not in this romantic embrace of Romeo and Juliet. So this is an illusion. Now let's look at these two words, consumptive Romeo and Juliet's diphtherial. This, of course, is an allusion to Shakespeare. We're going to move on and look at another allusion. She says in a poem, one fly buzzed, that is, was still alive. Emily Dickinson has a poem called, I heard a fly buzz when I died. We'll hear more about that. 